Okay, we're going to continue our discussion of integrated pest management today by taking another step down the IPM process. We are going to look at step number two, which involves identifying your pest. A very important step, and we're going to talk all about the different types of signs and symptoms of pests in the landscape. So it is important to remember that a pest is any organism that competes with, feeds on, or infects a desirable plant, and more so to the extent at which it causes an undesirable effect. So just because it's there and feeds on your plant or has some competition, that doesn't automatically classify it as a problem and therefore as a pest. It has to exceed a certain level and then it becomes a problem and then we call that organism a pest. So let's look at a number of different types of organisms that are commonly referred to as landscape pests. First off, we have fungi. Uh, fungi is the plural of fungus. You can say fungi, fungi, fungi. And fungi are unique organisms on Earth. They're not plants. They're not animals. They're technically closer related to animals than to plants. Most of us know of fungi as mushrooms that we consume, portobello mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. In actuality, the mushroom is just a small piece of the entire organism, the fungus. And mainly what the fungus is composed of is an underground kind of network of cells that are in strands or filaments. And those cells are called hyphae and they form networks that we call mycelium. So kind of an underground stringy structure called mycelium. So because fungi are so small in their structure, they don't really take a huge role in our world. We don't think about them too often. However, we know that in soil and in relation to plants, fungi play an incredibly important role. Most of the fungi on the planet are either beneficial or benign to your plants. So it's only about 5% of the species that we know of are potentially problematic to your plants. And when I say problematic to your plants, it means that they will either consume or parasitize your plants in a way that damages the plant. 95% are going to actually be neutral or maybe even beneficial to your plant. So we don't automatically go out there and kill and destroy any fungus we see. In fact, we want to encourage a rich diversity of fungi in our ecosystems, in our gardens and landscapes. However, there are some that are problematic and those we need to be aware of in order to act appropriately when they start to inflict damage. The next general category is bacteria. Bacteria as well are neither plants nor animals. They're something separate. And bacteria are ubiquitous, which means they're everywhere. Uh, on, on you, in you, all in our world, we have bacteria. And we have bacteria in and around our plants as well. Again, like fungi, most bacteria is beneficial or benign. A small percentage is going to be pathogenic to your plants. So you can have bacterial diseases that are inflicted upon your plants. And the next big category of disease causing agents is a virus. We're very familiar with viruses in today's modern world, in particular with viruses as they affect humans. However, viruses will affect any living cell but that virus is specially adapted for that host. Are viruses technically alive? Do we call them organisms? Well, kind of depends on who you ask, but uh, most of the time viruses don't meet 100% of the conditions 
required to be called living, which means they can't reproduce on their own out in nature. They need to reproduce inside an organism. So we have viruses that impact our plants. Now, the, if a virus impacts a plant, don't worry, it can't get you sick. So humans, animals, plants, we don't share viruses among plants and animals. You don't have to worry about getting yourself or anyone you know sick by coming in contact with a plant virus. However, viruses can damage our landscape plants, our agricultural plants, and they can cause some pretty severe problems. Most of the time for viruses, there's not a whole lot of treatment or trying to kill something that's not truly even alive. But we want to contain, we don't want to encourage the spread. And eventually we discover that plants themselves will develop resistance to certain viruses. And so when we discover those resistances or even encourage a plant resistance, we can then introduce those into the landscape so that way old viral problems don't become problems again. Most of the time it's not going to really kill your plant. Uh, the virus actually wants to keep the plant alive if it had a choice. And for agriculture, viruses become a problem because they reduce the overall yield of the crop. Uh, so whether you're growing citrus or grapes or any other kind of agricultural commodity, viruses have a big chance to come in and really mess up your production until we discover, find, encourage resistance among the plants. And once that is developed, it's introduced into the trade. So that way those viruses don't become a problem into the future. And then next up, a big category of pests in the landscape are insects. Most people think of bugs, they think of insects. Insects are kind of a subcategory of arthropods. And insects are anything that have uh, six legs and segmented bodies. Aphids are a classic example. Beetles, all of the ants, bees, flies, they're all insects. So most of our, what you think of as bugs, creepy crawlies, those are a, a whole category in and of themselves of pests or potential pest organisms. Now related to insects are the things that have eight legs and you think of spiders or mites. Uh, ticks would also fit in this category of arachnids, but the spiders and the ticks, they're not really a problem for your plants. However, the tiny little mites, they can become a problem. Spider mites is what we call them. They make little tiny webs. They're very small. They tend to not have a segmented body and they have eight legs. They're very similar to any other type of insect, but they're not as closely related. So when we control for mites or control for insects, we have some uh, broader options because we can specialize down to that specific uh, organism and not hurt the insects if we're going after the mites. And then another broad category of little things that eat your plants are snails and slugs. These are mollusks. You're all, you're all fairly familiar with snails and slugs. They tend to do damage to tender herbaceous plants, uh, things like uh, vegetables, uh, lettuce or cabbage in your veggie patch, um, but they could also potentially cause some problems in some other tender herbaceous perennial plants as well. There are some predatory snails and slugs out there. There are some native species, some invasive species, and especially in the aquatic ecosystems of freshwater lakes, we're always wanting to make sure we're not introducing any harmful uh, snails and slugs uh, into new landscapes. And then we've got nematodes, nematodes. These are small round worms. Round worm is basically like what you think of as a worm. So a little earthworm is a round worm, but the nematodes, they're very, very small, uh, primarily microscopic. So these are uh, only things you see in under a microscope. And we've got predatory nematodes, those that eat other nematodes. And we've got plant eating nematodes. And there are certain 
conditions that can be caused by nematode damage in your landscape. These are particularly difficult because they're, you can't see them. So you can only see the effect of what they do. You can find their damage and we can try to encourage a rich diversity of life, maybe get some of those predatory nematodes out there to combat the uh, harmful plant pest nematodes. And then of course we have vertebrates and this is a broad category. These are all the animals that uh, are big animals, gophers, moles, squirrels. In an urban population, you'll have dogs and cats. Uh, we'll even have birds or potentially people, uh, depending on what you're doing and where. So there's many methods for dealing with uh, vertebrate pests. And again, like all of them, uh, prevention, exclusion, uh, not allowing them access is going to typically be your best bet. And then finally, we've got other plants that will either compete with our landscape plants or potentially invade an, a wild ecosystem and cause problems. So there's different types of weeds. There are just those weeds that we don't want in that space. We call them a weed. It's pesky. It's always popping up but it's not really gonna cause an environmental problem. And you can still call that a weed, that's okay. If you're an, a tomato farmer and a native plant pops up in your field, you're gonna call the native plant a weed. But if you're taking that same land and trying to restore it back to wild habitat, if any tomatoes continue to pop up, you'll call the tomato a weed. So a weed is just a definition that is a plant that people don't want at that place at that time. But there are some plants that are a little bit more weedy than others. And you can think about uh, the RK selection of population dynamics. The weedy species are those R selected species. And there's some plants that are called noxious weeds. Typically that's a reference back to if you're grazing with animals and you're gonna have any plants that pop up that can be poisonous or toxic to your cattle in a grazing setting. And then we've got invasive plants or uh, invasive species that are introduced non-native plants that are not kept in control. Nobody eats them in the landscape, in the wild, and they tend to spread. And they can not only just spread and outcompete, but they can also change environmental conditions over time so that the native habitat no longer becomes uh, the, the primary habitat. And so there's many categories of weeds, but here's our broad overall nine general categories of pests in the landscape. Now, when it comes to identifying these pests, it's the number one step. You need to have a proper identification and all the rest of your actions follow that. If you don't know what's causing a problem in your landscape, you shouldn't do anything yet because you could be doing something that, first of all, isn't going to work because it's going to target an organism that's not causing the damage. But what's worse is you're gonna maybe cause more damage yourself. So until you know what is causing a problem, you cannot do anything. Well, you should not do anything. So it all starts with proper identification. And with a proper identification, you get a diagnosis of a problem. And this is essential for choosing the right control actions. So when we talk about identification, we talk about two things we're looking for. The first are we're looking for signs. Signs are the presence of the actual organism. You see it, or you see or detect direct evidence of the causal factor, the organism. So either you see a rabbit in your garden, that's a sign, or you see droppings in the garden and you can identify those are rabbit droppings, that's a sign of rabbits. Similarly, you can put out a trap and you can attract certain organisms to detect whether they are present or not present. What you're looking for are signs of the pest. Now this is different than our next category of things we're looking for. And the next category is symptoms. 
So symptoms are changes in your plant's growth or appearance in response to the causal factor. So not only are you looking for the problem, you're looking at your plant and trying to detect what kind of damage do you see and who does that kind of damage. So signs and symptoms are both important things to be observing. A sign is not enough to act. You want to verify that the sign of the pest has actually turned into a problem or a symptom that you can detect on your plant of interest. With disease causing agents or microscopic things that you cannot detect, the difference between a sign and a symptom may be not so easy to differentiate. However, it's important to just keep both of these in mind because as we go through our identification steps, you need to know the dual categories, the signs of a pest and the symptoms that they show when they cause damage to your plant. And with the proper analysis of signs and symptoms, it's important to get it right because you let the observation lead you to the diagnosis rather than if you have an idea in your head and you start looking for the explanation to match that idea, you can potentially tell yourself a story that seems good, but we wanna always approach every scenario with an open mind and only think about the evidence we see before us. And from that evidence, we can act and let that lead us to a proper diagnosis. There are cases where multiple problems may have similar looking symptoms. It can be easy to have a, a biased view or a filter when you view things and you don't wanna get it wrong. So when we talk about plant symptoms, there are a, there's a number of terms that we use to uh, think of it like us being the doctor and the plant comes to see you and you say, okay, you've got, uh, I can detect you have leaf distortion, necrosis, and some dieback and blight. Those are symptoms. So let's look at some of these common plant symptoms. And remember, there are multiple causes for each of these symptoms. So just because you see this on your plant, you don't automatically know what the cause is but these are the things you can observe going wrong with your plant. And so we'll present these uh, in alphabetical order. And the first one we can start with is blight. Blight is a condition that a plant experiences when it has a rapid discoloration and death of twigs, foliage, or flowers. So uh, one of the things that characterizes blight is it's quick. It happens quickly. And it starts with a subtle change, color usually turning yellow, and then very quickly brown dead spots that spread. There are many infamous occurrences of blight. Uh, some of them include the great Irish potato famine, the disease causing organism, uh, expressed itself with blight. American chestnuts are a native tree to the eastern part of the United States that are virtually extinct in the wild because of uh, a blight that was introduced and has stuck around. So the tree can never get larger than a certain size before it dies back. And then locally, we have another uh, disease organism that causes something called fire blight where it looks like the leaves and the, the stems, the twigs have been scorched or burned by fire. And what, what we are all describing is this symptom known as blight, where it's rapid and very quickly turns to death. It can be found in leaves or foliage, flowers, and twigs. Next up, we have canker. And a canker is a dead area on bark or a stem. It's usually sunken in and discolored. So it looks like a wound of some sort. And it, this typically occurs on woody trees and shrubs. Sometimes it's benign, meaning it won't 
automatically kill your plant, but other times it's the indication that your plant has a disease that's going to be lethal. And so canker can be because of fun, fungi or bacterial infections. And you want to make sure if you observe canker that you attempt to reach a proper diagnosis. Now, canker is different from blight because canker is slow to develop. And so it can take years and years for it to really uh, cause the overall problems. But oftentimes, if it's observed, it may be too late and you can't really do much to treat the, the plant. And so this is another thing you're watching out for are these cankers or dead areas on the bark of trees and shrubs. And next up we have chlorosis, which is simply the yellowing of the leaf. It can be also in a green herbaceous stem, but usually it's when the green part of the plant turns yellow, mainly the leaves are turning yellow. Now you wanna be careful because some of this is natural. You know, in the fall time when the leaves fall off the tree, the plants, the leaves will turn yellow before they fall. So that could just be a natural condition. Also, there are some nutrients in the soil that need to be present in order for plants to create chlorophyll and therefore be green. So yellowing could be the result of a mineral deficiency. But it could also be the result of a pest or disease uh, impacting our plant. And so remember, the symptoms don't tell you who's doing it, but they give you clues. And one of these clues is chlorosis. In particular, you're wanting to look at where the chlorosis is occurring. Is it on the old or the young leaves? Is it on the entire leaf or just in between the veins of the leaves? All of those sorts of things give you clues on whether it's a mineral deficiency or whether it's a, some other abiotic factor like salt burn or something like that, or are you truly showing uh, a symptom of a disease? And then there's a general term, a general symptom of decline, which is just a progressive decrease in plant vigor, meaning it, the plant is looking weak and it just gets worse and worse over time. It's just sort of a general term that we call decline, and it kind of can include a bunch of these other symptoms. So if you have a bunch of symptoms and they progress over time, eventually the whole plant is in decline. And so decline can be rapid or it can be slow, and it's something to observe once again. And then we have dieback, which is simply the progressive death of plant tissue starting from the tip and working its way back. So usually we observe this on the outer shoots or branches of trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants. They start to die from the tip and it works its way back. That's called die back. Another thing to be watching out for. And then we can observe in our wildland and in our gardens, uh, kind of an interesting condition known as gall or gall-like growth. So a gall is kind of like a tumor, in, if we wanted to use an analogy. It's a growth. It's an abnormal localized swelling or enlargement of a plant part. Now, galls could be caused by insects, mites, diseases, or abiotic disorders. And similar to like a tumor in a person, it doesn't always mean a big problem. It could be benign, it could be not a problem, or it could indicate a disease or a problem with the plant. And so these, these growths, these localized swellings, sometimes they can be quite large on big mature trees even. And then they have their own ecologies. There's little wasps that will come in and only live in the gall of an oak tree, for example. But this is just one other thing we're looking out for in the landscape. Do we see any abnormal growths on our plant tissues? If you see the exudation of sap or like a sticky gum type material, that is known as gummosis. 
That's how you would diagnose that problem. Uh, you've got gummosis if you are oozing sap. And clearly that's something to observe and to take into account in an overall situation to arrive at a proper diagnosis. Leaf distortion. This could be where the leaf is either twisted or cupped, rolled up, or otherwise somehow deformed. Again, this could be caused by a mineral deficiency or it could be caused by a disease. And in particular, what we see here is a peach leaf, which in our area is very susceptible to a condition known as peach leaf curl. And that's what we see here. We would recognize a leaf distortion as a symptom of a disease called peach leaf curl. And we have leaf scorch. So this is a browning along the leaf margin or along the outside edge of the leaf and it goes into the leaf from the edge. And as if it's been burned, as if somebody held up a lighter or a match and was burning the leaf, that's known as leaf scorch. And if you look closely in between the dead spot and the green spot, you can see kind of a yellow transition. So you might recognize a little bit of chlorosis in between necrosis and healthy plant tissue but it's the general pattern of going from the outside margins to the center that we call leaf scorch. And then we have leaf spot, which is a, a dark spot. It doesn't always have to be dark, oftentimes is. It's a spot or a lesion on the leaf. And these can be caused by a whole number of organisms. Once again, they can vary in color, in size, in pattern. And we can use these variations to help us arrive at a proper diagnosis. Many times you'll see leaf spot in combination with other symptoms too. And so it can be tricky to pull apart chlorosis, leaf spot, and scorch, for example. You may have a plant experiencing multiple problems at once. And then we have necrosis, which is basically the, any dead plant tissue. So necrosis in, is included in dieback and in blight. That's necrosis. But that general term, necrosis, is any dead plant tissue. You've got chlorosis and necrosis. And how they are arranged in patterns can be clues to tell us things. Different symptoms tell us different things. And then plants can wilt. So a general wilting of the plant or a plant part uh, is something to be watching for. We know that wilting could be caused by overwater or underwater, or it could be caused by heat stress or a few other things, but it could also be the symptom of a disease causing agent or some kind of a pest that has inflicted damage, maybe even below the soil, impacting what the plant looks like above. And then there's a symptom known as witch's broom. This is an abnormal broom like growth where you get many weak shoots growing off of a single point along a branch or stem. And this is often an indication of uh, some type of uh, an infection. It could be detrimental to the point where it's gonna cause damage, or it could be something that isn't necessarily a huge problem. It could be even things like mistletoe uh, are plants that are parasitizing your main plant and they'll create something that looks like a witch's broom. It's technically a different plant, but that could be problematic or it could be just fine. Witch's broom type conditions could be caused also by uh, an infestation with insects that are damaging the terminal tips of the branches and causing stunted or strange growth it could also be the result of like a genetic mutation of the individual itself and may even provide some desirable characteristics such as like a dwarf species or a, or a dwarf variety of a common landscape or horticultural agricultural species. And now let's just look at a few of the different types of signs that you're going to be looking for in the environment and on your plants. And one of those would be fruiting bodies. Fruiting bodies are the reproductive structures of fungi. These can be mushrooms, puffballs, 
rusts, conks, and you can see them all over different parts of the plant. In our image here, you can even see them on the underside of a leaf. And these are the reproductive organ organs of the fungi, meaning they're sticking out and they're gonna spread their spores to try to reproduce in the environment. And if you see this, this is a, a sign, not a symptom. A sign is pretty good indication that we've got a fungal infection going on in this leaf. You may see the actual bug itself, the mites, the insects. We've got scale, we've got thrips, we've got flies, we've got spider mites, we've got mealybugs, we've got aphids, and there's a whole bunch of other things that can be there. Now, one thing to pay attention to when you're identifying these insects and mites, are you looking at the problem or are you looking at a predator of the problem? So just because you see a bug doesn't mean it's a problem. We gotta get that ID just right and verify, are you looking at something you wanna kill or eliminate or remove from your garden? Or are you looking at something you want to actually encourage, keep around and try to have as a natural pest control in your garden? So these become very important for proper ID. You may see mycelium, which is just a mass of the fungal threads known as hyphae. Uh, they can be found even on the plant surface, coming up, going on the outside and through the plant. Uh, just a fuzzy network of typically white threads. So if you see that, that's a clear indication that uh, fungi are present. Rhizomorphs, those are shoestring-like fungal threads, and they will be found under the bark of trees. And usually it's a tree that is stressed and dying, and it's a certain type of uh, fungus group that will cause that. They might be brightly colored. They might be, uh, in, under certain lights, even have an appearance of glowing. And then we've got slime flux or ooze. This is a bacterial discharge that oozes out of plant tissues. It can be gooey, kind of slimy. It can be dried and kind of a dried mass. It can even appear as bubbles or foam. And oftentimes in our trees, we'll see them oozing out of old wounds. So if a branch has broken off in the past or if somebody has come along and cut a branch, you can see where uh, the bacterial you can see where bacteria will discharge over time from that wound. And oftentimes after a rain, uh, you see an increase in ooze from an infected tree. Now, when we pay attention to all of these signs and symptoms, we're also trying to think in time space. So we need to know the time frame for the development of these signs and symptoms because if you just take one snapshot, it may not tell you a whole story. Part of what we need is to know how quickly these came and developed, or at what point in the season or in the kind of multi-year cycle are we? And are we experiencing something natural that we can live with? Or are we experiencing something that we may need to intervene and assist our plants? There's a few generalizations. These aren't always true. But it's helpful to know that symptoms that occur suddenly and do not progress are typical of abiotic disorders, meaning it's not a pest causing your problem. It could be a water issue. It could be a soil issue. It could be a, somebody damaged something by driving their car into it. But uh, if it's a symptom that develops quickly and doesn't get worse, then that's usually not a problem from a pest perspective. However, it's a, if it is a symptom that develops over time, keeps getting worse and worse, this is typical of a living factor or usually an insect problem or a disease problem, or they may be combined and the insects could be introducing the disease. So we always wanna be thinking in time and watching multiple points in our inspection of landscapes to get a clear picture. So there we go with a broad overview of some of the general categories of pests in the landscape 
as well as some of the most common signs and symptoms we're looking out for as we're monitoring, inspecting, and trying to go for a proper identification of any pest problem in the landscape. Remember, this is the second step in IPM, and it's vital for all the future steps that we get this one right. It's a fun journey to really learn and discover all the different types of life that live on and around our plants. And it's very important that we take the time to do the research, look it up, figure it out, so that way we don't cause harm and we can actually intervene in a way that results in the proper outcome, which is a healthy, thriving landscape with minimal damage, no harm to humans, and a thriving overall ecosystem as well.